Good morning. I'm Dennis Roxter, Senior Pastor at the Duluth Bible Church, and this is the day the Lord has made. We will rejoice and be glad in it. So glad that I could join you through uh, Zoom today, and as a result, hopefully share some thoughts with you, truths from the Word of God that could be of benefit to you in your own personal life. As you can see from the shared screen, that many people today are like this man, who, and they have a lot of questions. They're wondering what is going on in light of the coronavirus or COVID-19 dilemma that has struck the whole world, including the United States of America. And I would like to open the Word of God with you every morning for a while here and share some truths from the Word of God that can give you a perspective, it can give you peace, it can give you purpose, during this time together. As I think of that, many people today are asking the question, why can God, how can God be good and allow human suffering and evil in the world? This is a dilemma. This is a question people have asked way before the coronavirus. How can God be good and allow human suffering and evil in the world? We recognize that Jesus Christ said in John 16, 33, these things I have spoken to you, that in me you may have peace. In the world you will have tribulation, but be of good cheer, I have overcome the world. You see, Jesus Christ today is offering you peace. First, peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ, by faith in his finished work, and then the peace of God that passes all understanding from day to day amidst the trials, the difficulties, the afflictions, the tribulation, and even the coronavirus time that we are in. You see, the Bible acknowledges the reality of suffering, the reality of evil, and the reality of tribulations. And we're going to explore the whole issue of suffering over the last or the next several devotionals. You see, as we think of our life on earth, it is filled with trouble. Whether you are a believer in Jesus Christ or whether you do not yet know him as your personal savior, life is filled with troubles. The believer is not exempt from this, and yet how the believer can approach this and respond to this in view of the fact that one day they're going to heaven is significantly different than those who do not know Jesus Christ is their Lord and their Savior. We recognize that there are those today that are asking the question, how again can God be good and allow for evil and suffering in the world? The proposition goes like this. If God is all good, he would destroy evil. If God is all powerful, he can destroy evil. But evil is not destroyed. Therefore, God is not all good or not all powerful. Well, that may sound reasonable and rational at first, but the reality is, is that this is deficient in several ways. And I would like to explain to you today how God can allow suffering, evil, and even death in the world, and why this is a reality we must understand from God's point of view. You see, the truth of God's word is that God being good cannot create evil. In the only book God ever gave, the Bible, given by inspiration by the Holy Spirit, and recorded with perfect accuracy so we could know the very mind of God in these matters, he makes it clear in James chapter 1, verse 13, Let no man say, when he is tempted, I am tempted by God. For God cannot be tempted by evil, and he himself does not tempt anyone. Now notice very clearly, that God doesn't even tempt people, let alone create evil. You see, God is good. He is good all the time. This is one of his intrinsic attributes. Even in the worst times on earth, and even the worst times in your life, I want you to know the problem is never God. God is good. And we need to remember that God is good even though he allows sufferings. The psalmist was reminded of that in Psalm 27, verses 13 and 14, when he wrote, I had fainted. I would have been in despair unless I had believed to see the goodness of the Lord in the land of the living. 
Wait on the Lord, be of good courage, and he will strengthen your heart. Wait, I say, on the Lord. And that is why in the following verses in James, he reminds us that every good gift and every perfect gift is from above and comes down from the Father of lights, with whom there is no variation or shadow turning. You see, God is good and God gives good gifts. God gives perfect gifts. They come from above, from him. And he is not fickle. He doesn't change. He is good. And he really wants what's best for us in light of eternity, no matter what it's going to cost him, as we'll see in a little bit. In doing so, the second truth we acknowledge from God's word is that he, being good, cannot create evil. And secondly, that God created all things very good. Again, you may be reminded of the creation week as God in the beginning. God created the heavens and the earth. And as he did on day one and two and three and four and five and six, he created various things in order to provide a place for man to live. The climax of his creation was the creation of man and then of woman in order to have a relationship with God in a paradise situation called the Garden of Eden. And we know that everything God created, he saw that it was good, and it was good, and it was good, and it was good, and it was good. And then on the last day, or the sixth day, he said that God saw everything that he had created, and it was very good. You see, God created all things very good. He cannot create evil. Therefore, suffering and death and disease and so forth does not come directly from a very good God who created all things very good. Genesis 1.31, And God saw everything that he had made, and behold, it was very good. So how did that which was very good become filled with disease, come filled with death, come filled with coronaviruses that are striking people of all ages around the world? How did this happen? Well, the third truth that we understand from the word of God is that God gave angels and mankind the ability to choose right from wrong with consequences for their choices. You see, he gave the angels that choice, and one-third of the angels followed Lucifer in his arrogant rebellion against God, and we call those angels today demons. They had a choice. They made their choice and they suffered the consequences. We know that God, in his desire to share his love with mankind, created a man in his image, and then a woman in the image of God, and, and, and in doing so, he gave them volition. He gave them choice, because there is no real relationship when it is forced. And not wanting a robot, he put them in the Garden of Eden. He said, of every tree of the garden you may freely eat, but the tree of the knowledge of good and evil you shall not eat of it, from the day that you eat of it, you will surely die. He gave them a choice, a choice in which they could either choose to obey God and have this ongoing relationship with him or to use their volition to disobey God. As we think of the element of choice, Dr. Norman Geisler, a theologian, has said it very well when he wrote, the power of moral choice entails the ability either to choose the good God designed for us or to reject it. The latter is called evil. It is good to be free, but freedom makes evil possible. Free will is odd in itself, but entailed in that good is the, excuse me, good in itself, but entailed in that good is the ability to choose the opposite of good, which then makes evil possible. If God made free creatures, and if it is good to be free, then the origin of evil is the misuse of freedom. This is not hard to understand. We all enjoy the freedom to drive, but many abuse this freedom and drive recklessly. Yet we should not blame the government that gives us the license to drive for all the evil we do with our cars. Those who irresponsible driving kills others are responsible for what has happened. Geisler goes on to say, remember the government that gave us the permission to drive 
has also informed us how to drive safely. Likewise, God is morally accountable for giving the good thing called free will. But he is not morally responsible for all the evil we do with our freedom. Solomon said it well, this only have I found, God made mankind upright. But men have gone in search of many schemes. In brief, God made the fact of freedom. We are responsible for the acts of freedom. The fact of freedom is good, even though some acts of freedom are evil. God is the cause of the former, and we are the cause of the latter. And so God gave us volition, a free will, in order to make choices that would have consequences that would either be good or would be evil. Dr. DeWitt, I assume he, David DeWitt, says it well when he wrote, in commenting on the consequences of choice, why must there be such disastrous consequences as heaven and hell? He wrote, without results, choice is insignificant. Suppose I offer you one of two milk chocolate bars, a Hershey bar, and a Nestle's bar. If the result of eating one is the same as eating the other, then the result of choosing one is the same as choosing the other. In that case, the choice would be insignificant. Now let's imagine a situation in which the result of your eating would be very different. Suppose one bar offered was a milk chocolate bar and the other a chocolate fav flavored laxative. Then the choice would be significant because the results of eating the two would be very different. And so we see that choice allows for significant consequences in our life. And so God gave man a choice. Man chose to rebel. In doing so, there was a consequence called the curse of sin and death that then went throughout the whole world. Now, as I think of choice, keep in mind that God gave his son, Jesus Christ, a choice. A choice to come to earth. A choice to provide salvation for sinful men who had disobeyed God. And we read about that choice in Hebrews 10. For the law, having a shadow of good things to come and not the very image of the things, can never, with these same sacrifices which they offer continually, year by year, make those who approach perfect. For then would they not have ceased to be offered. For the worshipers, once purified, would have had no more consciousness of sin. But in those sacrifices, there is a reminder of sins every year. For it is not possible that the blood of bulls and goats could take away sins. Therefore, when he came into the world, he said, Sacrifice and offering you do not desire, but a body you have prepared for me. In burnt offering and sacrifices for sin, you had no pleasure. Then I said, Behold, I have come in the volume of the book. It is written of me to do your will, O God. You see, under the Old Testament law, there were sacrifices for sin, in which an innocent animal died in the place of a guilty sinner. Blood of bulls and of goats and of lambs, and yet they could never take away sin. And that's why they were offered year after year after year. But in the plan of God, God would choose to send a son who would choose to obey his father and would come to earth to do the will. Of God. And thus Jesus Christ, God who became a man, came to earth. And in doing so, by that will, we have been sanctified through the offering of the body of Jesus Christ once for all. Unlike the animal sacrifices that were, again, repeatedly offered, Christ's offering of his body was once for all. And every priest in the Old Testament stands ministering daily and offering repeatedly the same sacrifices, which can never take away sin. But this man, after he had offered one sacrifice for sins forever, sat down at the right hand of God. And why did he sit down? Because upon the cross he was dying for you, and he was dying for me, and he paid for our sins, past, present, and future, bar none. And on the cross he cried out, It is finished, to tell us die, which carries the idea of paid in full. Was that word to tell us I was stamped on a bill or a receipt that was paid in full. It was stamped when a jail sentence was over. And you see, upon the cross, the payment for sin was fully made and fully paid 
once and for all by Jesus Christ. And so Adam and Eve had a choice and they disobeyed. The consequence, we were born into the world, sinners in need of a savior. But God loved us, sent his son, and God had a choice. His son had a choice. And his son, Jesus Christ, came to earth and he died and he paid for our sins completely. And on the third day, he was raised from the dead. And that is why, as a result, the gospel is that Christ died for our sins. According to the scriptures, he was buried and he rose again the third day. And as a result, he now offers you and me a choice, a choice of salvation. For the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life in Jesus Christ our Lord. You see, salvation is not a reward for the righteous. It's not accomplished by our human efforts and our works, religious, good, moral, and otherwise. Oh no, it's a gift from God, paid for by Christ, offered in love. But in keeping with the concept of volition, we have a choice to either accept that gift or to reject that gift. And when the Philippian jailer asked Paul and Silas, what must I do to be saved? Their answer was clear. Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and you shall be saved and your house. As he was obviously concerned about the other members of their, his family. And indeed, that may be true of you today. You may be in need of salvation and you may be concerned about the other members of your family, whether they're going to survive this coronavirus or not. And let me just remind you that if the corona doesn't get you, something else will eventually get you because it's appointed unto man once to die. And that is why we need to be saved from a hell we deserve to a heaven we don't. And God loves us. Christ died for our sins. He rose again. And to receive the gift of salvation, we must simply put our trust in Jesus Christ, banking our eternal destiny on the truth of God's word, that Jesus Christ died for our sins and rose again so that we trust in him alone for our eternal salvation. And that is why the Bible could say in clear language, I've written these things to you who believe in the name of the Son of God so that you may know 100% that you have eternal life. Now you might say, well, Pastor Dennis, I've already trusted in Christ and I'm going through this virus time as well. How should I look at this? And I am reminded what Jesus said to Paul in the midst of a difficult trial he was facing. And he reminded Paul, who had been saved by God's grace, that my grace is sufficient for you. For my power is made perfect in weakness. And the Lord understands what you're going through. He's there for you. He will never leave you. He'll never forsake you. His mercies are new every morning. He's still on the throne, and it's a throne of grace. And he's there to meet your every need as you walk by faith and not by sight. In our next devotional, we will build on this one and answer the question, does God understand about suffering? Until then, let me pray with you. Our dear Heavenly Father, I thank you again for the wonderful message of salvation and how your word gives us answers to the questions we have if there's someone here today who's watching this and has never been saved, they don't know for sure they have eternal life. May today be the day they put their trust in Jesus Christ. For no church can save us, no works can save us, no rituals can save us. Only the Lamb of God who came to take away the sin of the world can save us, can forgive us, to give us eternal life and settle our eternal destiny. And for those believers who are watching, Encourage their hearts that this is the day that you have made. Your grace is sufficient to fulfill your will in their life on their way to glory, knowing that one day they're going to go home. But in the meantime, the battle rages and you have a race for them to run, looking unto Jesus, the author and finisher of their faith. So thank you for these times together now. We give you the glory for this and we thank you for all our blessings in Jesus precious name.